Hello Blender Conference, my name is Alex Chamberlain, I'm a professor of art at Utah Tech University and I'm the chair of the art department there and I'm also in charge of the entertainment arts and animation emphasis in which we use Blender as our primary tool of creation. I should start off by telling you that uh, even before I could really walk or talk properly, I've always been a dinosaur enthusiast. And the reason I eventually learned Blender was because I saw Jurassic Park in theaters when I was 12 years old. Here's one of my very first pieces of paleo art. You can tell that this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex because he has two fingers, uh, his head touches the sky, he's pretty happy with his place in the food chain, he's taller than a house. I think that is a self-portrait of me looking out of the window. Uh, here's the house door, and for whatever reason, Mickey Mouse also ended up in this composition. Uh, over the years, I've continued to work on my paleo art, and I think, I'm, I think I'm getting better. On a recent spring break trip with my family, I was particularly awed by the experience of walking up to a cast of a T-Rex skull, and the context that that provided for pondering my place in the proverbial food chain of life. I think it's important for people to be able to feel small in nature. And that feeling and my desire to share it are the reasons that I create. Uh, the driving force behind all of my artwork, including my frequent use of Blender, is to be able to share my imagination, my feelings, and my experiences. That's also what drives me as an educator. So, after this experience, I determined to spread and share uh, what I'd felt, the experience that I'd had. So uh, here, for instance, is a recent self-challenge that, uh, that I assigned to myself to recreate this iconic scene in Blender with a more accurate T-Rex and learn from Steve Williams and Phil Tippett along the way. So I began searching the internet for high-resolution 3D scans of T-Rex skulls. I wasn't really totally clear on how, but I knew that if I could get the data into tools with which I was familiar, in other words, in a blender, I could find a way to create it tangibly. I've done a lot of my own field work along the way. Any time I visit a city, I check to see if they have a dinosaur museum. It turns out no one wants to give away a 3D scan of a T-Rex skull. It also turns out they don't have to. Uh, did you know that fossils can be copyrighted? T-Rex fossils in particular are usually copyrighted because they're incredibly valuable. Sue, the T-Rex that's on display in the Chicago Field Museum, set a dangerous precedent in the year 2000 when she sold at auction for over $8 million. The price was covered by a variety of donors, including Ronald McDonald House and Disney, and since Sue, the prices have just continued to increase dramatically. Uh, another specimen, Stan, recently sold for $31.8 million. Museums, of course, can't afford these prices for individual specimens, so these incredibly rare, one-of-a-kind fossils are increasingly going to wealthy and often anonymous private collectors. As someone who's used to the NASA model of, hey, your tax is paid for this, here's all of our raw data, have fun, I found this closed system to be incredibly frustrating. NASA's example has shown that when scientific data is shared, we all benefit. Even if that benefit is just an augmented sense of wonder and awe at our universe. Uh, fortunately, I was able to find a loophole. This is AMNH5027. Although this mount was updated in the 1990s, uh, you'll probably recognize the old posture here. It's a very recognizable specimen. You might even recognize it from some popular media. When I was a kid, there were about a dozen known T-Rex specimens. And today, there are around 100. AMNH5027 is unique and, to me, special because it was the first T-Rex specimen that really gave us a good look at this amazing creature. 5027 was discovered in 1908 and went on public display a few years later. T-Rex specimens 
differ widely in their distinctive shapes and 5027 is very recognizable. Its silhouette is also distinctive for the displaced ectopterygoid that you see forming a bump here in the large anti-orbital fenestra. That bump is still clearly visible even in the Jurassic Park logo. U.S. copyright law specifies that a work enters the public domain after a certain amount of time. The law has changed occasionally over the years, but 5027 is well into its public domain years. While that may be the case, those with access to 5027 still haven't chosen to release any 3D scans publicly, and in any case, a 3D scan would be considered a separate work and probably still be protected under copyright law. I've also been pretty surprised to learn that even if scientists are interested in sharing their data, they're often restricted from doing so by the organizations they work for. Many museums, for instance, even restrict uh, the taking of photographs in their displays of their displays uh, by just ordinary visitors. I have no idea what the advantage of that practice is. I, I think it's very questionable that there's any advantage at all. Um, clearly, though, I needed to create my own 3D data. I was even prohibited from making my own scans, I asked. Fortunately, there are a lot of photos of 5027 out there, and some of the original schematic works are also in the public domain. Using these and countless other photos as my references, I fired up Blender and I started sculpting. As an aside here, I'd like to express my amazement and gratitude for tools like Blender and the organizations behind them. As a 12-year-old kid from a rural community watching Jurassic Park in 1993, I was standing at the beginning of a long and frustrating road to try to learn computer animation. The resources necessary to model and render pretty much anything were so far out of reach that I had accumulated years of gleaned knowledge from my local public library and even some scattered PBS specials before I ever got a chance to hit render on my first frame with an actual modeling application. When I was finally introduced to Blender, my entire world shifted into a fast lane of opportunity. So thank you to Ton and to everyone whose work has gifted us this amazing, incredibly powerful tool set. So I got to work in Blender. I pushed, I pulled, extruded, and sculpted, vertic sculpted vertices until I created a very dense mesh. One of the challenges that 5027 posed, and indeed part of what makes it so easy to recognize, is the amount of lateral distortion in the skull. From the sides, the skull looks amazing, and from the front, it looks like it was run over. Geologic forces will do that over tens of millions of years. So once again, Blender came to the rescue. I wanted my skull to be idealized without distortion. Using Blender, I was able to create shape keys to undistort the skull while still keeping the original shape for future use. I sent my first sculpt to a foam CNC shop where I was, it was sliced into one inch sections and cut into pieces of styrofoam. I ended up hand sculpting the delivered pieces due to the lack of resolution in the deliverable from the foam fa fabricator and I painted them into a finished form. The skull was then requested and subsequently donated to a natural history museum near my hometown where it's still on display to this day. While the foam skull was a satisfying exercise, it really didn't preserve the accuracy or detail of my digital sculpt as I had hoped it would. 3D printing offered solutions to those problems and also came with a new set of challenges. A print this large requires either a very large printer or a lot of small prints. In my case, uh, the latter was, on, was my only option. So I created a cube slightly smaller than my maximum printable volume and used that cube to inform Boolean operations to divide the skull into 93 pieces. I calculated that the cost of filament and printing at my university would be around $1,500, which for an art teacher is a bit prohibitive. However, I was able to buy my filament for home printing for around $500, and I estimate that I probably used about $100 in electricity. I was also able to inexpensively source two printers. One of them was from a local surplus auction that needed minimal repair, 
and one came from a friend, broken, and just required ordering some replacement parts from the manufacturer. When I was done, I had two working printers with reasonably large build volumes for less than $300. I kept a spreadsheet detailing how much time each print took and compared it with the predicted time from my slicing software, which was Cura. The Artemis Delta printer was much faster. I watched the timing carefully and set alarms so that I could wake up and remove a finished print and start a new one so that my printers weren't just sitting idle for long periods of time between prints. I wanted to see how quickly I could print the entire skull. I feel like the decision to make lots of small prints instead of a few large prints was validated every time there was an error, and there were a lot of errors. It was a lot easier to recover from the loss of a small print than it would have been to recover from the loss of a large one. This is a 25 gram golf ball, a hairy golf ball that I accidentally made, for instance. This was probably my biggest error. Uh, I printed using ABS plastic so that when the pieces were ready, I could dissolve the print supports into acetone and solvent weld them together and paint over the seams with the resulting plastic slurry. Here you can see the process of solvent welding and covering seams. After 45 straight days of printing and welding, I had my skull. So why? Initially, I created this skull because I wanted one and that's still important for me. This project has put me in touch with a variety of paleontologists, scientists, materials experts, and other enthusiasts. And I believe there's a powerful solution to a pervasive problem here. Fossils are scarce, but access to them doesn't have to be. Scarcity creates value and demand. When fossils are scarce, valuable, and in demand, we lose them to privileged classes. Hitting the auction block, a prehistoric discovery that is expected to fetch millions of dollars. It is this a is Stan. Skull. At least that's well, how we humans have called this Tyrannosaurus. 19, please. 19 million. Really? Uh, 27. It's really, sorry, 27 one, please. This takes it to another level. It's the ultimate trophy. If the skeleton of a giant Tyrannosaurus Rex went on sale in Zurich today. This is a big deal. The giant carnivore named TRX-293 Trinity is expected to fetch five and a half million to eight and a half million dollars. To put it more bluntly, 40% of the T-Rex fossils discovered to date are now in the hands of private collectors and out of reach of scientists. That 40% includes unique juvenile specimens for which we have no growth stage equivalent among the scientifically accessible specimens. Beyond this ethically questionable but completely legal issue, the value and scarcity of fossils has encouraged a thriving illegal black market in which valuable sites are dynamited or bulldozed for quick access to fossil matter by the ton. The pieces of which are then sold at rock and mineral shows on eBay as jewelry or, or trinkets. Uh, this is a photograph that I took in southern Utah. And this was taken in an area that is a veritable boneyard of sauropod remains. However, most of the remains are negative spaces in broken rocks where the fossil bones used to sit before they were harvested by illegal private collectors. Most of the dinosaur bones that you see in museums are casts or sculptures. This, for instance, is a mostly sculpted Torvosaurus skull. Close examination of this specimen makes it easy to tell that a lot of the detail is hand sculpted. Straight, even lines and smooth surfaces don't really pass easily for fossilized bone under a critical eye. In many cases, uh, fossils are even 3D printed for museums now. Pictured here is a 3D printed leg bone from Trix, one of the largest, most visited T-Rex specimens in the world, which is housed in Leiden, the Netherlands. They're generally, though not always, very good replicas. And they give a genuine experience to visitors who come for a sense of wonder and perspective that a museum can facilitate. The generation of artists who have been empowered by Blender and other open source initiatives can make a difference here. 
The paleo scientific community needs to think seriously about giving better access to their 3D scans and associated data. Withholding access for the sake of the profitability of the specimen is a small and questionable benefit for a single organization and causes large-scale harm to the field overall. It inflates the value of the fossils, which prices public institutions out of access and encourages their sale into private hands. To quote Dr. Andrew Farkey, if paleontologists and museums claim that fossils are part of the world's heritage, unnecessarily restricting distribution of and access to digital representations of these specimens conflicts with an ethic of fossils as world heritage. Blender has shown both the power and feasibility of an open source model, and I would encourage the paleontological community to take note. And speaking of open, if you would like my files so that you can 3D print your own life-size T-Rex skull, you're welcome to them. Um, unfortunately, Gumroad won't allow me to ho host a, uh, a data set this large without a minimum charge of one dollar, so for a dollar they're yours. Scan the QR code, download them, and have fun. Happy blending. Thanks for listening.